What's up, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Today's guest, Paul Xavier, is the founder of contentcreator.com. He's in the core space, but he's also a real estate investor who scaled pretty quickly. He's more of a recent entrant, as he describes it, but he's already built a nice size portfolio. He's a GoBundance brother. I, I knew I knew that right away. Like I, I, I remember our first conversation. I remember everything about this guy from the first time I met him. Paul, welcome, brother. <laughs> it's great to be here, brother. I'm glad that uh, you mentioned that. You have an amazing memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, Paul, Paul. He's like, yeah, we talked like four months. I'm like, oh, sorry, man. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm in my 40s now, man. It goes, it goes fast. It goes fast. It so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. GoBundance has been a, uh, it's been a gift, honestly, for myself. I've been in the course creation mastermind world for a long time. And just a quick kudos, like you guys are awesome at what you do. If, for really? anybody who's listening, GoBundance, GoBundance yes. is great. For, the, for everybody who's listening here, who's thinking about a mastermind and maybe came from a place where they were not happy in the past, that is not the experience you'll get here. Wow. Yeah. That's been my, yeah, it's funny. I, uh, same thing. Like I've been in a couple of different ones. They're good, but this just took it to another level. I think there's uh, like, there's no guru that helps. Like it's peer to peer. That's, that's always great. Right. You don't like following yeah. one guy or his le- lessons or message. And uh, you know, just the, I think the go bundles does a great job of leaning into the different pillars, right? Like health is represented. Relationships are represented. Uh, adventure is represented. It's not like, yeah, that's nice fodder. Like all of it's incorporated. So anyway, Let's get a little bit more about you though, my friend. So give us a little backstory on the Paul Xavier. Yeah. So um, I was born in a little village. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I basically was, uh, I, my parents were uh, divorced as a kid, grew up lower middle class, didn't really know much about money or uh, wasn't taught anything about money. I had one of those like moments with an awesome mentor for myself, who was my best friend's father. And uh, his name was John Kovac. And um, uh, my best friend dropped out of high school, got his GED, and then went and started working for the government, making like $80,000 a year while I was still in high school. And he was supposed to be a junior in high school. And I was like, uh, excuse me, how much money are you making? What you doing? That sounds awesome. Can I do that? And so I didn't get that um, uh, job. I finished high school and um, went and worked as a personal trainer. I was thinking about going to the military. And then that, uh, my best friend's dad, John Kovac, was like, hey, I want to give you an opportunity, but you have to earn it. You have to work. And so he gave me the opportunity to become a software engineer and recruiter for his government contracting firm. I had to read a bunch of books, learn how to code in C Sharp and T SQL. I did that, failed forward pretty hard for a while and finally earned a spot on the team and built out the recruiting engine for that company and worked as a government contractor on the outside, not inside the uh, government, but basically on the outside for his firm for probably four years. And he built it up and sold it. And when he sold it, he gave me the best advice ever, which was don't stay as an employee for the rest of your life. Do something different. Go out on a limb. You're smart. You're energetic. You're you're going to be able to figure it out. And so I, I took his advice and started freelancing on the side. And essentially one day was able to make more money freelancing on the side, doing website development, hosting websites for people, shooting video content, editing it and putting it online to help them basically market their small businesses, which was actually kind of like this ecosystem we were in in the shared office space for the government contractor back in the day. And so did that, quit my job, which was at the time a little premature because then I went down (laughs) and uh, I failed for a while and finally found some success building a marketing uh, agency of sorts. It was basically like a video marketing company working with auto dealerships. And me and my friend, Mark Ford, we built a company. It's called Market Slide, scaled that to about a half a million a year, um, which was great. It was just us and some contractors that were basically like virtual assistant type of people um, doing video and marketing stuff. And I kept hiring my friends who were in film school. Most of my friends were creative types, artists of sorts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was hiring them to come shoot these videos for us for these marketing campaigns. And they're like, how are you making so much money doing this? Like I'm in film school, getting myself into a ton of debt right now, making no money at all. And uh, I want to do what you're doing. So I started basically helping some of my friends who kept asking me questions because I was hiring them teaching them how I was doing what I was doing. And sure enough, they did it too. They went out, started getting some video agency clients, making a couple extra thousand bucks on the side of their, you know, college education. They were loving it. And then the word got out more and more questions came, more questions came. And I started, that was the first time I ever started thinking about doing education, like actually becoming a 
quote unquote coach or um, online course creator or whatever it is. And so I started looking for some structure and I started hiring a bunch of people to teach me how to do coaching properly, how to do a group coaching program, how to build a DIY course, how to build a mastermind group. And so I started just exploring all those different options. I ended up basically shutting down my video agency um, for auto dealerships, that is, because I don't like that environment or those people. And I'm not, I'm not a car guy at all. And I started working with businesses that I actually enjoyed working with, which was awesome. Um, so, you know, yoga studios, just like companies that were uh, fun to be, or like more than anything, not necessarily a company. Like I had a DUI lawyer, which doesn't sound fun, but the guy who was the lawyer was the coolest, funniest, like fun person to be around. And he loved what he did because when he was a kid, he got DUIs and he was helping people through that process of making a huge mistake in their life. And he was like, I take responsibility and love this. And so that was the thing that I found is I love being around passionate business owners who are awesome and helping them grow. And so I started doing this coaching and working with companies um, that I really liked and uh, built a, uh, my first million dollar company was literally just Paul Xavier. If you go to mrpaulxavier.com still today, you could see some of our original coaching offer messages and stuff like that. We did about 1.5, 1.7 million in that first year of doing the group coaching program. We called it Next Level Creators. It was awesome. Um, really fun. Used a really simple proven model that's out there. It's been there for years. And then um, through that, I had a bunch of students who wanted to work with me. And there are these creators. And one of them's name was Anthony Gallo. He was a pre-med student um, in uh, University of New Hampshire. He graduated, built a multiple six-figure video agency through the Next Level Creators group coaching program we had built. And uh, I started hiring him to do some cool little motion graphic stuff for me. And the kid was just relentless. He would not stop over-delivering and coming to me with new ideas and then over-delivering, coming with a new idea. And so I just couldn't help but like, I need to work with you. Like you're, you're too much of a go-getter. And so we partnered on our first DIY course that was called 14 Day Filmmaker. That was in April of 2020. Um, something else happened in April of 2020, March of 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And good time uh, for course creators though, yeah. Good time for course creators and also a very, so we, we were working on that program for about maybe like 30 something days. Anthony was building out the marketing for it and stuff. And uh, we had no idea COVID was coming. I think we launched the week before COVID hit. And do you remember what COVID's lockdown was like 14 days inside? Oh, the first lockdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First Two lockdown weeks. was flat the curve. Yeah. Our, our course was called 14 Day Filmmaker. <laughs> Perfect. Completely didn't expect that. Basically, we're going to teach you professional content creation skills in just 14 days. That was complete luck. The thing took off. It just mm. skyrocketed. And um, to date, we've had... Uh, as of right now, I believe we're sitting at close to 44,000 students. I think we were just about to pass that for 14 day filmmaker. Um, so that's incredible. We're wow. very, very blessed. That's a $48 program. Um, and uh, now that's uh, we, we bought the domain. We're content creator.com now in our, our passion and business model that we're doing there is basically creating the most affordable, effective, streamlined and fast education products for content creators in the world. So wow. yeah. if you want to learn professional content creation skills, just as a hobbyist with your cell phone, with a DSLR mirrorless camera, like the Sony you're shooting on right now, we'll teach you that in 14 days. So that's the skill. We also teach people the business backends of each of those. So how to build the content strategy business, which is what I built with, you know, working with different types of companies. Now, Anthony went and scaled. We'll teach you how to build courses, online courses and group coaching programs and mastermind groups the same way we run ours. Mm -hmm. We'll teach people how to build a YouTube channel and scale that and become an influencer of sorts and the economic models behind that. But it has to come back and resonate with us in those key areas. Will it be the most affordable product? Will it be the best product? Will it be the most efficient product and succinct Will it show people how to do this in the fastest time frame possible? If it hits those buckets, then it will fit on contentcreator.com. And if it doesn't, we won't create it. 
Interesting. And we're going to talk about real estate investing here in a minute, because you, you've done that and we'll, you know, you've moved uh, your, your entire life to a new place. I, there's so many places to go that we were talking about before recording, but I want to st- spend a minute here because this is a very popular space nowadays, right? The online course play space, uh, coaching masterminds, all of that stuff. I'm in that, I'm in that space, right? So I have interest here and I didn't get a chance to, uh, I know you spoke in uh, Park City. I didn't get a chance to stay for that. I came in for just a, a minute and then I got called out of it and didn't get a chance to come back. So I, I missed on that. But um, you say affordable. I'm curious. Like, is there, have you, maybe it's just your model, but is there a, a, uh, a more of a desire do you, th- do you see, or is it better to have like that 48, 50, $97 type course that's completely, you know, uh, uh, completely self paced or, you know, I hear people saying like, you know what, you want to go for the Cadillac. You want the 1997, 2997, 4997, like that course, like talk about affordable. Like what is the, what is the balance there? Is it, you know, like, how do you decide on it? What should somebody decide on? Do you feel like it's better to have that 44,000 units sold, if you will, at 48 bucks or the higher end price point or what, what decision tree do you have on that? It depends on your strategy. There's different ways of doing it. There's reasons people use a book funnel and lose $80 selling books. Yeah. It's to, it's to basically buy quality attention from the right types of people that they can then upsell into the higher end products. Yeah. There's also reasons where you would stick around with like a $698 program or a $48 program. So it really just depends on the offer. The, the, when I say affordable though, really what I mean by affordability is, is it the most affordable, effective program. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of programs in just education out there that is garbage. The reason mm, I would say the online education space is, is it's a really negative reputation. And a lot of people have a bad perspective on it is because most of the products are, there's such a low barrier to entry. Anybody can create a product. You can throw it up in, in literally half an hour. It does not take a long time. Um, does that mean you sell are selling a quality product that's actually going to help people solve a problem or achieve a desire? Most of the time, the answer is no. Mm. Most of the time, the answer is I want money. And so I'm just going to sell something. That's what we see all of the time in our space. And that is the, one of the big things that we're pushing back against. So we create the most affordable education that works. There are techniques and strategies and things you have to do to ensure that your success rate and your programs are at the top of the market, like the best of the best. And that's the stuff that we do that differentiates us, essentially. Like we're putting practice exercises and forcing people to submit homework exercises to show us they're truly developing skills. We will create um, uh, action-based like exercises that everyone has to do to get to the next level in the program to unlock it. Because otherwise, if you haven't done that, you're not ready for the next thing. You're not ready for stage three when you're at stage one in your journey, right? Yeah, there's a lot true. of, there's a lot of issues. Cause like, uh, you, you know, this being in education as well. And um, the price point of your offer, it really is going to determine on what you're helping people with, how many people are in the market, what the competition looks like. And then if you're like, how you are going to make sure that yours is the absolute best product for solving the problem or achieving the goal at a certain price. That it's an analysis that you have to do. We have a way of doing it for ourselves that we believe is the best. There are a lot of people who have that, but that's how okay. we come to our justification for affordable. I think you touched on, on it a little bit. The other word is effective. I like that word. I like how you said it's got to be affordable and effective, right? You mentioned about people doing assignments and making sure that you track with them that you know certain features don't or certain parts of the curriculum don't open up until you've taken action on the first part. Expand. Is that it? Is like what, what is effective? How do you determine effective? Like what is the is it is it feedback based? Is it star rating yes. review? Is it like give me an idea of like what, what are like three or four pillars of effectiveness that you that you use? It depends. So every course that we've ever created and that we instruct our clients to create has what we call a quantifiable end result. That means you are taking someone to an end result, an end goal, and it has to be quantifiable. Right. Pretty, pretty straightforward on that. So let's just say, I'm going to teach you how to shoot cinematic content in 14 days. The end result is you are shooting high quality content in the timeframe of 14 days, right? That's the objective. In order to grade yourself, we have to get someone to, at the end, produce a piece of content, share it, 
and feel good about their skills, feel as if they have created something that is cinematic, that is quality. And so we have a community and we have a submission at the end of the program where people go and get direct feedback from their marketplace, from either their clients or our community telling them, here's what you did right, here's what you did wrong, and here's how to get better. And that is essentially our end result that we're helping people get to in 14 days, whereas most people had never truly edited a video. They'd never done sound design. They'd never done any of these things. And we're going to teach them every aspect of shooting, picking their gear, lighting, telling a story, putting it together. They actually create multiple videos in that 14 day time period. Every single day, they're mastering a different piece. And at the end, they have that final deliverable where they shoot their first professional video. Wow. A All second right. version of that though. Oh, so that's yeah. like a skill. That's like a skill program for a lot of your yeah. guys. Your this community, Go Abundance, is very goal oriented. So yeah. I typically say there are two areas you can create a course. Okay. First one would be on developing a skill, like a right. Yeah. Second one would be on achieving a goal. Mm. For achieving a goal, that would be something like our um, 30 day course creator program. We're going to teach you how to build a course that gets to a six or seven figure run rate in 30 days. Okay. Yep. How would we? identify or grade success on that quantifiable end result. Well, the end result is six or seven figure run rate for your course, 30 day time frame. So we measure that by at the end of the 30 days, we have people submit their results to us so we can grade how have we done? How did you do with the program? Where are the results that you, you're at? How are we looking? And we grade our success on our student success based off of that. We don't grade it off of five-star reviews because those don't really mean People can feel like they did great, but how many people actually achieve the end result? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Great point. You're making me think about some of the stuff I'm doing now. I got to make sure it's high quality. It's effective to your point. So um, I was going to ask too. So what have you found? You mentioned like the book funnel that people will build. So they'll write a book and from that, they'll do an order bump of maybe a mini course and then a more of a profit multiplier of a larger course and then maybe into a coaching mastermind type program, right? Like they'll, they'll build this funnel out, lose money on the book because they get it on the back end and then some, right? For launching a course, if somebody does the 14-day filmmaker, uh, wants to build a course like that, or the 30-day course creator program, all of that stuff, right? What have you found are the most effective, in today's world, effective launch strategies? Is it ad spend behind a challenge or a webinar? Like, you know, what, what structures are, are you finding right now are the most effective for, uh, for course creators? I'm a, if you're starting out, start with a group coaching program, higher ticket, lower volume of human being solving a big problem or uh, uh, helping people achieve a big goal. Mm. The reason I say that that is the best place to start is because um, I'm talking to the masses, the 80, 20 of the world, and 80% of people don't have a huge following. They don't have this massive email list. They don't have YouTube followers and just tons of people. Right. So if that's you, you don't have a lot of free distribution. If you have a ton of free distribution, you can make a bunch of money selling a $48 product like that. Yeah. But if you're just getting started and you don't have a lot of that free distribution, you also have to recognize you don't have a lot of the skills that it takes to be successful creating ads, developing a bunch of content, selling something online to complete strangers. And those skills take time to develop. And most people, what I see is they'll go and they'll write a book and then know that it's going to be somewhat of a loss leader, hoping that it'll make money or selling something that's really cheap. And they, they just burn out. They burn out in two months. They burn out in six months. They give up and they say course creation or online education is just not for me. It's not what I'm good at. I, I'm going to stick to my thing, right? And I'm like, well, that's not necessarily a problem with, it's a problem with your strategy. You didn't start out from the right place. So the 80-20 yeah. for most people is solve a big problem where you don't have to get a ton of clients to make enough money for it to be substantial to you. I like that. I like so that. that's where I start with most people. Um, someone who's doing that right now in GoBundance would be Jake Harris, who's doing a great mm. job with his triple yeah. net due diligence course, right? We had a good chat on that in the um, Park City. And um, when you do that, some of the good things about it is you can move really fast, Jamie. I mean, look at what he's doing. And yeah. um, this is exactly what I, I recommend most people do, which is basically a pre-launch. I'm not a huge fan of building your course and then going to sell it. Yeah, I've seen true. so many people waste six months of their life building something absolutely no one wanted. What yeah. a waste. It's yeah. terrible. So what we do is we pre-launch everything before we, because that helps you identify whether or not you actually have a market that wants what you have to offer. 
How, how, so, how quickly do you pre Is it, is it at concept? Is it at, Hey, concept outcome, basic layout, let's pre-launch this. And then we'll, we'll, we'll put it together after like, how quickly do you, is it like, I got an idea. Let me, let me sell this. Yeah. It can be that quick. So what you need to do there, there's, there's idea like, Oh, here's this idea. Um, for example, learn content creation in 14 days. Right. If I just put that headline on a page and had a buy now button, that's not going to work. No one's going to buy that. Right. You have to have enough clarity around how the offer is going to actually deliver the end result, the quantifiable end result to your client for you to package it together and, and sell it. So you do have to, what we typically instruct people on is how to do market research and analyze um, where opportunities exist in your marketplace. Because one of the number one things that stops people from building something is they say, everything's already built, right? Everything's for free on YouTube. Everything is already said out there. There's a million other mentors who have more credibility teaching this stuff already. Like there's no room for me. And that's just a bunch of BS. It's, a, it's an excuse that a lot of people will tell themselves to not go contribute in the education space and share what they've learned that most likely is different and a unique perspective on finding success in their, their thing. Like, I don't know two real estate investors who do everything the same, not a mm -hmm. single two. So can you get a lot of value from one and the other who are successful? 100%. And so what you need to be able to do though is analyze a market and then recognize where you're going to differentiate your offer and kind of put together this mind map. We call it a minimum viable product compass. Sure. So a minimum viable product compass is basically this, this vision. We use a tool called Trello to map out what modules would be in the course, what practice exercises, what worksheets, what um, things and stages people have to get through to actually achieve the quantifiable end result. Once you've done that and you've worked through it all the way and you've mapped it out, you're selling that map. You haven't built it yet, but you've thought through it. That's the key. Um, at that point, you can create what we call just a, a lot of people call them video sales letters. I call them value videos. Uh, basically, my objective is to provide value to you in the form of clarity, right? This is something in online education that I think is very important, right? Clarity is value. For someone who's out there wanting something in their life, wanting to solve a problem or achieve a goal, and they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off in the sea of YouTube videos and Instagram content that's motivating, entertaining, but not truly helpful, um, you get to provide clarity and cut through that noise to that individual and show them step-by-step step how they could achieve the end result that they're after. And then you say, and not only can I help you with that, next week I'm launching our course where I'm gonna work with a small group of people over a six week, week period to do these things. Yeah. Jump on, schedule a call with me below and we'll talk about getting you into the program. And to your point, if you don't have a large distribution, if you don't have a large audience, big Instagram, affinity-based Instagram following or YouTube subscriber base or email list, then yeah, you, to your point, you're going with a small group. Like you have some people that would be willing to partake in, in what you, what's the, it's like you need a thousand raving fans or something like that to make a million dollars, something, right? Like you don't need a huge, huge audience to do this, but you can create something that allows uh, a certain subset of people to come in and get high value out of what you're creating. So that makes a ton of sense, Matt. I could... I'm going to go to contentcreator.com, obviously, and start poking around here. I could go for, for a long time on this, but I want to make sure we talk about the rest of your story. So you're up in Maine. You're doing this thing. Somehow you got into real estate investing. Like what, yeah. what was that? What was that pivot? Like when did that happen? And talk to, talk to me a little bit about that. So th this goes to um, just kind of like maturity, I would say, throughout my own life journey was... Um, you know, at a certain point, you're making all this money and your biggest expense becomes taxes. You know, like, what do wealthy people do? Because this is ridiculous. Like, at a certain point, you're like, I'm paying what I used to make per year four, four times over to the tax man here. And I know not every, and I know the wealthiest people in the world don't do this. And you're trying to figure out like what to do to change that. And also you're just trying to figure out like, Owning um, an online education business, there's a lot of guys who are on the hamster wheel. I see them in my space like every day of the week. Um, 
they uh, they'll go out and they'll they'll believe buy the nice car and then work to earn the car. Mm. I'm not a huge fan of that, but m- mantra. I'm more um, a fan of like, okay, well, I have the ability to go buy the car, but I don't want to spend on myself. I want to try to figure out how to buy assets. And I always kind of knew that from reading Rich Dad Poor Dad um, when I was younger and getting into like understanding real estate was sooner or later going to be a part of my life um, as an investment. And so at a certain point, um, I had built the team at contentcreator.com to kind of be sustaining things and giving me a a lot more freedom of time. And so um, I was talking with Anthony Gallo, who was uh, basically my um, uh, product creator for the 14 day filmmaker program. He's the filmmaker who's the the educator inside of that course. And he was like, yeah, I want to get into real estate too. Like, do you want to do you want to do this? Do you want to collaborate on it together? And so just like, I think many things in life, one of the number one hacks for uh, accomplishing something new is get into an environment of people or get an accountability buddy. Who's going to do that thing with you, like Mm -hmm. work with you, show you the way. And so um, we ended up just kind of looking around and reading a bunch of books on it. And we bought our first deal in, I think it was March of um, no, no, it might've been March of 2021 was our first deal together. A year ago ish. Yeah. Yeah. About a year ago as of this time frame, Um, And so we just started buying real estate at that point, like going about it, figuring it out. might've been tw- March of 20, 2020 actually. Cause uh, yeah, well, it was, it was one of those timeframes. It was like two, two years we've been doing it now. Um, and so uh, we bought our first deal in Missouri from a turnkey real estate provider. Sure. So this guy I have had a lot of trust with. Um, and um, then we ended up buying two more from him. Um, those all three were in Missouri. I got an opportunity from my wife's father. Um, uh, so my stepfather, he was, uh, uh, or whatever you call that, uh, know, yeah. father, <laughs> father-in-law. Yeah, he was, selling, uh, he was selling a house in Kansas that was an investment property he bought for uh, my wife's sister to live in while she was in college. And so I picked that up because it made sense as a rental. There's another one down in Texas that we picked up, just a friend was selling it. And uh, we just started picking up all the stuff, not knowing what we were doing. And then boom, we got hit with all the expenses. <laughs> Everything went wrong at one time. We're like, okay, I knew this was coming. <laughs> um, so we had yeah. a bunch of expenses that hit, you know, foundation repair, a couple extra little things like tenants moving out. One tenant didn't pay for like four and a half months. Um, so we had some, some issues as we were going, but we kind of looked at it and just perceived it as this is a part of the journey um, we're willing to pay the price. And fortunately we've, we've always kind of built that structure where we have our cash engine with our business that we love and it produces a lot of free flowing capital. Real estate is the investment that we don't need right now, but we are planting seeds. Every house is another seed. It's another tree. And I love that that tree. Yeah. It's funny. First off that you mentioned rich dad, poor dad, and you had your own rich dad, poor dad experience. It sounds like in life, right? Like your buddy's dad was the rich dad that, that brought you into the contract. Right? And then you had your dad who, who, uh, you know, like you said, lower middle class, that's funny. But, um, what you just said, man, I, you know, I, I'm always cautious in saying this, but I, I talk to, you know, a lot of people ask about real estate investing and like, they want to know they haven't invested yet. And I always say, it's like having kids, like you, you can't know until you do it. Right. And, and look, you talk about Jake Harris, Jake Harris will tell you the story in 08, sitting on a curb in Tucson, Arizona, negative net worth because of all that just crashed down behind him. Don't get me wrong. You can get crushed in real estate. And right now we're all geniuses. Everything in real estate is up and to the right. We're all doing great. Who knows what the other end of it is, but all that said, you can't know what's real about real estate investing until you invest in real estate. Like what you did. Okay. Let's buy these turnkey properties. Then you bought one in Texas, one or Kansas, then Texas, and kind of off to the. I know you got some in you know North Carolina and Maine and Japan and everywhere around the world at this point, right? You got pieces of real estate. I'm just kidding, but um, but the point is, like you said, like things happen. I remember we have sewer pipes go. And like ah, how much is a sewer pipe? I didn't think that happened. Like I didn't hear that on bigger pockets with sewer pipes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. But you can't know until you do it. And even in Jake's case, sitting on a curb you know, 12, 14 years ago, uh, you know, out of money and, and just wishing to be worth nothing. I remember he says that he's like, I wish I was worth yeah. nothing. That would be so much better than what I am right now. He's here. He's standing up oh, yeah. here. You are, you're standing up, right. You're doing okay. And again, it's the, the lesson in my mind. Isn't like, just go buy something. It's like, you know, scratch out some numbers. Does it make sense? 
If it does go, if you've got, you know, you got the capital, some reserves go. And uh, I love that you've just sort of run with it. You've taken the bull by the horns and, you know, you're picking up property and you're learning along the way. I, I, I think that um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, learn that imperfect action is always better than no action. Yeah. Like hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think I've learned is um, don't do things alone when you're the dumbest person in the room. Like there's so many smart people in real estate yeah. and um, you, you just, if you're going to do something with a partner though, just have legitimate transparency with that partner. Cause I've had bad partnerships that, that long-term didn't work out like nothing where someone did something awful to me or would I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, I, sure. I have a pretty good thermometer as far as people and how their intentions truly are gamming or whatever. You, yeah. 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 But when you know, someone is going to be doing something with you and you're, you're going to be making money together in some capacity, make sure that um, you have those harder conversations up front if you can. And if they're unwilling to share data points about an investment with you, walk away. Yeah, that's yeah. literally it. There's all, there's another expert out there who's willing to share everything with you and uh, like be completely transparent. So I have walked away from quite a few different things when, even when I was not uh, smart or intelligent in real estate, because I wasn't getting the information that I needed to feel confident. And at the end of the day, you need to feel confident with whoever you're partnering with, but that is a absolute cheat code um, in life. You know, that's how I got the three of the properties that I have here is from a partnership here in North Carolina that I'm in now. Amazing. Amazing. I want to talk about your move here coming up, why you did it, all that stuff. But it's funny. I, I record podcasts uh, on Thursdays. That's kind of my recording day. I record three to four each Thursday, which to be honest with you, my heart, the hardest thing for me is to go to bed Thursday night. I get, so this is my favorite, my favorite thing to do. I love podcasting. Um, but there's a theme each week, it seems like, when I sit down and record, right? Last week, uh, there was a bit of a theme of, uh, of uh, uh, the unknown, like you know, living in the unknown versus the known, very Jason Drees type of stuff, right? That kind of popped up last week. This week, I've had AJ Osborne on, I've had you, and I've had one other gentleman, uh, Nathan Smith on, three, three GoBundance members. And the, the theme is, as you did it with your, your real estate course, AJ said, because of all he's gone through with... Uh, with um, uh, you know, being paralyzed at one point and then, you know, still being in pain to this day. It's, you know, you, you, action doesn't wait. Like we don't think about doing things. We just do things. So to your point about buying the property and imperfect action is better than, no, than inaction. But even on the course side, like you said, like we scratch it out and we pre-sell the course. We, what did you, I think that's what you call it, right? Pre selling the course. Um, yep. You know, you're doing things first and then letting yourself figure it out after the fact. And I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a trait of every entrepreneur I know, at least, and especially the guys in GoBundance. Do you see the same? I absolutely see the same. Richard Branson's a huge proponent yeah. of don't know how to accomplish, like have an opportunity that came your way that you want to say yes to, but you don't know how to do it. Say yes, you yeah. will figure it out. And Tony Robbins says the most important skill in life is resourcefulness. When you really think about it, like success is the capability to constantly be resourceful. Like you're going to run into obstacles. And if, um, you allow, because uh, really paralysis on doing, on taking action comes from fear. I was going to ask you that. Uh, yeah. It comes from fear of an obstacle. It comes from fear of a challenge coming your way. And there's nothing wrong with like being afraid, but that's what court the courage is for. That's what also is the most valuable thing on the journey of life is overcoming obstacles. It creates character. It creates everything that matters to us, like internally as human beings, it, it's going to create that personality that you're proud of. Um, that's what you like. You should really be craving is those opportunities where you don't know how to do everything just yet, because that's where you're going to end up getting out of your comfort zone and growing. And uh, I think it was Mandela said about courage you used that word a moment ago it's not it's not the absence of fear it's overcoming it something like that right and that's kind of what you just yeah. talked about uh, and similarly again it's the theme of the day there's a guy i interviewed named akshay nanavati he's one of the episodes he, he will have released before this one uh in the uh in the in the flow of it or whatever but he wrote a book called fearvana great great book dalai lama wrote the forward for it really fascinating i'm actually reading it listening to it right now and it's what you just described it's it's the idea that fear can be fuel it's the idea that overcoming it is the greatest 
greatest thing you could do. I mean, this guy puts himself in, you know, he climbed the highest peak in Antarctica recently and he has two fingers that might just fall off here. Literally, they're so black with frostbite, it's ridiculous, but he puts himself in those positions to overcome fear. Like how far can I go? Because he uses fear as fuel. So I love that. What do you think is at the heart of this fear? So I don't want to, ah, God, you're telling me go out and charge people, whatever, a hundred bucks a piece to buy a course I haven't made yet. I have never built a course. Like I, all of a sudden I got a hundred people paying me a hundred bucks each. Like, what am I supposed to do here? Like, what is that fear derived from or, or buying a piece of property or whatever it is? I don't know. Just your thought. Like, why are people so fearful of failure or of whatever? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, throughout his like learning and, and throughout a bunch of relationships, someone else decided to quit at the obstacle you're afraid of. And then someone else decided not to. Mm. Right. And if you're listening to the person that decided to quit, that is probably going to paralyze you. Yeah. Look beyond that though, for the person who decided not to quit, you know, thinking about quitting versus not quitting, like go listen to the toughest human beings in the world. Listen to don't hurt me by David Goggins. Listen to, um, extreme ownership by uh, uh, Jocko uh, I Willink. Think it's Wilkins. Willink. Willink. And, Willink. and it's yeah. like these guys, um, they put themselves through a level of intense pain and failure that, like, you as an individual and me as an individual, um, uh, I'm talking to like everybody out there, yeah, sure. probably don't probably don't recognize as even like a possible, and they failed and then they came back. When you fail at, a, at, a, at something and you have to take responsibility for the loss of someone else's life and telling their family, like, that's an ultimate failure. That is, a, that is something that would paralyze human beings from putting themselves in a position to ever have that type of responsibility. The same way a lot of people will not hire people in their companies. They have the capital to, but they won't hire someone because they're afraid of being responsible for that individual's family for having to fire that person in the future. The same way a lot of people won't take on the responsibility of leaving the nine to five job to go out and be a freelancer or, and, and take it. And they'll say, well, I have kids and I have a wife, so I can't do this. I can't, I can't. And it's like, okay, well, why can't you? Cause I'm afraid of not being able to provide for my family. Right. And I get that. Like everyone has that. We all have it at our own degree, at our own level. And that, that experience of fear um, is really kind of like a, uh, it's like a thermometer, right? Like it's a, everyone has a different one. Everyone has a different gauge on what they're comfortable with and uncomfortable with and what they're afraid of versus what's completely natural for them. Like, ah, this is nothing. I'm not afraid of this at all. And so I think the, one of the most important things is just having the self-awareness within yourself to know, are you making decisions from a place of fear and if so, what is causing it? Because most likely try to pinpoint the people who put those ideas of fear into your mind. Because most of the time, we're not coming from a place of like true first principle thought. I'm the first person to think of this. Most of the time we're coming from a place of, I've heard a bad story. I've heard this happen to somebody. I don't even know who their name was or what their name, all of this happened to my father. So my father, because that's someone I know and trust and love and they raised me, the same thing would happen to me. So I have to not do that. Like, that's interesting, man. Have you put keynote on your resume yet or what? I mean, is this, this a keynote speaker? Come on. That, that was amazing. That was an incredible <laughs> outline of fear and, and how to overcome. That's awesome, brother. That, that was great. I, I didn't expect or know that this interview would go there, but that was memorable, my friend. That was memorable to our conversation prior to. <laughs> I had no idea either. Yeah. That's great. Is, well, something I just, you said. I think Go ahead. I think it no, just no, no, comes please. from like both of us kind of like hashing it out. Like I'm sure I think both like being in this community of people who oftentimes when you, you come from less than nothing, like you're negative, yeah. you've been in those places, those deep, dark depressions, you've experienced that in your life. And so those are the intrinsic moments that I kind of call to and like, well, those are the challenges I had to work through myself. Mm. Yep. I love that. The, uh, the, the two things that jumped up in my mind, it's like, so you talked about uh, somebody gives up and somebody succeeds and that whole three feet from gold story right and i relate this to go abundance actually because that story is always like don't give up you never, you never know when you're three feet from gold like the idea of it is never give up it's like ah that's not actually what the story is the story is the guy gives up three feet from gold digging right sells all of his stuff to another guy and then what people cut out is that guy went out and sought out the advice and counsel of experts then went digging and was three feet from gold right that part 
is, is left out. So it's not never give up and grind and push and hustle till the end. It's find the right community of people that can help you get there. And that's what GoBundance has been for me. And I know that's what it's becoming for you, uh, which is great. And then the other part, you talked about that, like understanding, is it fear? Like, what is this that I'm feeling? Uh, you know, I know, <laughs> I know I've done this and I know people have done this with me and it's like, wow, that's really interesting. I want to pick their brain. I want to learn from that person. But what really my objective is, is to learn how you're special so I can justify why I can't do what you're doing. Does that make sense? Like if Absolutely. you're buying a whole bunch of real estate, right? And it's like, oh, I want to do that. But I don't, I mean, he's got to have a treasure trove of cash or like when I quit my job, like the first thing is like, oh, but your wife has a job, right? I'm like, no, no, she doesn't have a job. And that's like, wait a minute, your wife doesn't have a job. What about health insurance? Like we had to buy health insurance. Like we had to go find our own health insurance. But then it's like, okay, but did you have a bunch of money saved? I'm like, well, yeah, we saved money. Ah, there it is. That's what, see, that's why I can't. It's like, okay. Like that. <laughs> you're afraid to take the step. You're afraid to take yeah. the step of saving the money, maybe to walk away. And I've done that with other people I know where I've been looking for, please justify for me why I can't be you or can't do what you've done or can't accomplish what you've accomplished. I know when I'm in that space that it's pure fear. There's, there's no rationale. There's not like a right or wrong. I'm just in fear. And uh, anyway, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but it just triggered me. I think that you may have just like struck onto one of the most important distinctions for self-awareness and success that exists, which is, are you using other people around you um, as fuel? Mm -hmm. Or are you using other people around you, the things, the people and the stories you are consuming online today as a reason not to? Yeah. If it's fuel for you, they are inspiring. They are the people you're reaching out to, to connect with, even though they have 400,000 followers and you're going to be tenacious and not stop until you get to connect with that person. It's like, you know, I, I feel that way about a lot of people. And, and I've had friends of mine who, um, uh, they use, they'll, they'll use parts of my life as an excuse for why they can't. And um, then I have done the exact same thing to people who are bigger and better at different times in my life. But I've started to, um, I think, again, just have that self-awareness of, um, and it, it, I think it comes through like whatever your practice is. Like the, the first thing with having a practice like this, and I think Jason Drees, I did coaching with Jason Drees for everybody who's listening, highly recommend him. He's a phenomenal coach. And um, he helps call you out on a lot of these stories that you might be having in your life um, of uh, you just don't recognize that this is the reason you're coming to these conclusions is this person, that person. But what if that wasn't there? What if you were open to something different, a different potential possibility? It's like the moment you open trigger that different possibility, everything opens up. But um, I've now made it a point to whenever someone is different, kind of like starting a podcast, like what you do, where you talk to really successful people in different lines of, you know, industry and life and relationships and fun um, okay. is that uh, that kind of breaks that fold. I think when you have that human to human connection with the person, you're like, you are a normal guy. You're a normal girl you're doing this and you're not perfect. And there are challenges in your life and there are areas of your life. This is one of the most important things about the one sheet and go abundance. There's not a single person who's at hundred percent in every area of the one sheet. It just doesn't exist. There are people who are doing 80 to 90 in a, a lot of the areas, but there's almost always one or two areas that need some help. Yeah. And that was the cool thing, especially being around like people who are worth a, you know, tens of millions of dollars or whatever it is. And having them tell me, yeah, but I'm struggling with teaching my kid um, and he's really struggling with this addiction. It's like, oh man, wow. You know, we can, it, it, all of a sudden we're human connecting one-to-one -one again and seeing that um, and then recognizing, well, here's how I can help you. Here's how you can help me. And then th this is no longer, a, I can't because I'm not like him, but it's uh, uh, I'm going to. Um, even though I'm not just like him, I'm going to figure out how to get to that spot too. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's really, really well said. And that's one of the things when I talked to I, you and I spoke when you joined and, and uh, a, I don't know that you asked, but a lot of, a lot of guys asked the question of like, I don't know if I have anything to really contribute to this community. Like, yeah, okay. I hit the million dollar net worth. I'm, you know, worth 1.5, 2 million, whatever it is, but I don't know what I can really contribute. 
you know, with a guy that's 10, 20, 30 million in net worth. And what you just said is it like that guy needs an ear and he needs an ear from like-minded people. Like, you know, there are people at 700,000 that are just as like-minded as somebody at 2.5 million. It's just as like-minded as somebody at 25 million, right? Like your lives are different. What you're doing is different potentially, but the idea is that you're, you're, you're in a space where it's safe to open up and be free and say, Hey, look, everyone sees me as invincible, big, successful, whatever, but I got I'm struggling right now because of the most important thing in my life. My child is struggling with something and I, I don't have any control of that, which is hard for me as a, as a blue blood, alpha red entrepreneur, right? That whole thing. But also like, I don't know who to go to. I don't know who to talk to. Like in my life, I can't have these conversations. So I think that's the value you give sometimes is just an ear. Just listen. I've I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think some of the stuff that like, you know, you'll hear like Ed Milet say this, but like if, if right now you're listening to this and, and you are that guy who's got 700,000 in the bank and everyone around you thinks you're the most successful guy and you don't know yeah. anyone above you, yeah. get out, <laughs> join a group like this as soon as humanly possible. Cause my friend, yeah. you have plateaued. Yep. And if it hasn't happened yet, you will start to feel either your ego is going to take over and you're going to become too cocky and you'll never grow because your ego gets too strong. And when your ego gets too strong, you don't allow the opportunity for the bigger and more successful in one area of life. It could be relationships, could be whatever, finances. That's going to get so big that you're like, I don't have to listen to this. I'm, I'm already there. You know, right. it's like right. you're lying to yourself there, but yeah. Um, yeah. Or, uh, you know, you're, you're just really going to start to feel bored mm. and you're going to start to like kind of get to this, this place of there's a void because when we're not growing, what's happening? We're dying. We're dying. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Let's dive into, we're, I, want, I still want to hear about Asheville, but let's dive into the one sheet questions and I think it'll come out through that. So uh, let's start with horizontal income. So what currently is your horizontal income and how many lines do you currently have of horizontal income? Lines of income. We have 14 right now, 14 different properties. And um, I've actually gone back and forward on this. So horizontal income, the way that I've written it down as of today is based off of net profit, not based off of gross. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's the way I'm supposed that's to. That's what I do. It. Yeah. Like you're okay. saying, after you pay expenses, after you reserve for CapEx, whatever, like what I take. Yes. Yeah. Accurate. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm at roughly 50,000. Okay. 50,000 annually. Now, do you consider, like, as you mentioned, you put some people in place. Do you consider any of your businesses horizontal income streams at this point? No. How much time do you spend on your businesses, on each of them? So that that varies on the business in the in the leg because we have a, the way I cut, I personally visualize each DIY, DIY courses as a, sec, as a business, group coaching programs is another business, masterminds is another business because they all have different setups. They have different marketing systems, sales systems, different CRMs and everything that we use to make them function at the peak that we can get them. Um, so I personally, I don't work that all that often. Maybe uh, right now, most of my focus is in building our real estate company uh, for mm -hmm. investing, but I would say I'm probably 15 hours a week across all those. All right. You're treading into territory of being horizontal. I, Pat Hyben would like made a rule because everybody was like, wow, okay. when is it, when is it horizontal? And I think Brandon Turner is like horizontal and vertical. And then Brandon Turner talked about like a, a, a diagonal where it's like, yeah, you're doing some work, but you know, it's, it, it comes in, even if you, if you didn't show up for a few weeks, it would still come in. So he had this rule of like, if you're, if you're four hours or more in a business a week, then it's vertical. If it's under four hours, four hours or less, it's horizontal. So you're kind of in that, if you got three business, you're considering three businesses, five hours each, you're kind of there. <laughs> I, I could be there across the board if I chose to. The reality sure. of where I'm at right now is I don't want to be. There you go. Um, yeah. I don't, I love uh, what we're building at contentcreator.com. And if anything, I wish I could put more time to it. Um, mm -hmm. the reason I'm sacrificing my time away from that business right now is because I'm building the engine for everyone on my team and for all of our students to have a real estate investment vehicle. That's beneficial to our long-term growth as a, oh. uh, an organization. I love that. So you're, you're, when you say that you're saying that you're helping each of your employees, everybody in your team get into this space. Correct. Wow. That's, uh, that's like, uh, go-giver type of stuff, man. That's amazing. That's awesome. Right. I love that. That's, well, that's very... it, it, one of the big pillars of GoBundance is contribution. Yeah. And so um, in our GoPod, it's me, Lee Robinson, Ryan Lasson, and Peter. Um, and we just, we've talked about this many times, like what, can, what is theoretic, like what is the line for contribution? 
And mm. to me, my belief is that giving someone a job who doesn't have the opportunity right now to develop skills that they actually want to do something, giving them a job and then giving them the resources to become a top level and then one day move on to another company or grow within mine, that's a contribution. Um, buying them education, buying them mastermind groups like this, putting them in a position where they can partner with me on a real estate deal, all of those things are contributions that they would not have otherwise had the access or ability to get. And so that's my primary way today of contributing is I'm sacrificing today for, yes, for myself, but also in alignment with what my team wants. That's cutting edge, I think, from a, just today's employee. They don't want, I want to be here 40 years and retire here. I want a pension. They don't, that's not what today's employee, not at least talented ones, right? They want, they want the gig. Hey, I want to come in. I want to help build your company, but I want you to be okay if I move on. But along the way, what you're doing is pouring into them in different ways so that yeah, maybe they stick around or maybe you partner, maybe they, maybe they grow into a, a senior, senior level person within your company. That's really cool, man. Wow. You're building a, an empire down there. That's cool. Uh, let's go to weight or uh, health real quick. What's your body weight, body fat percentage look like? Former personal yeah, so, trainer, you staying in shape? Uh, so I did have a personal trainer in Maine. I just got here to Asheville. So I haven't found a new person yet. No, no, no. I, I said you were a former personal trainer, right? Like you used to be a personal yeah. trainer. Yeah. yeah, for a little while. Yeah, that was a that was a real side gig. I was not the, the best at that by any means. Um, but uh, I, I don't have a personal trainer right now. My body fat percentage is sitting between 17 to 18% right now. I'm sitting at 163 pounds right now. How tall? I don't know why I don't ask that on here, but how tall are you? I'm a little over five, seven. Okay. So we're, we're pretty much the same five, seven and a half, five, eight, 163. We're pretty much the exact same build. Yeah. Only you have better hair than I do. So um, <laughs> I don't know about that, man. Yours looks pretty good. It's pretty tight, right? What about, <laughs> what about diet and exercise? What did diet and exercise look like for you right now? Uh, so I actually, my, um, my objective on my one sheet is 365 hours of yoga this year. So at, it comes out to one hour a day, but I give myself flexibility. I do a lot of the hot yoga classes where it's an hour and a half per class. So mm -hmm. I can, I have the ability to shrink or compress the time. I'll probably do a yoga retreat where you do yoga for nine hours a day, like every day for a week this sometime this wow. year as well. Why um, yoga? So why, why, why so into yoga? I'm curious. So um, one, uh, I think it just, I think everyone has a different thing that they feel like called to, and that makes them feel the best. Like some guys and gals are just like their mentality and they're just wired physically for CrossFit. Mm -hmm. um, other people are wired and physically like they resonate with yoga. And I just happen to fit into that as someone who I think my lifestyle is a lot of on the computer, sitting in, in working outside shooting videos with my team and then going and doing real estate stuff. We were sitting and driving for 45 minutes to go look at a, a deal that you finally got under contract. And it's like, it's a lot of sitting. So yoga gives me that. Um, I kind of also feel like Darwin's like, you want to be flexible and adaptive and if, if it fits to the survival. So, well, okay, okay. I'm, I want to be fit and survive for a long time. So I want to be flexible and I want to be strong in the flexibility. So that's where yoga comes in for me. Is, I'm assuming coming from, you know, central Maine, you know, Augusta area to Asheville, probably a few more yoga studio options. No, much more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's one five minutes in pretty much every direction of me here. Is that why you moved there? Uh, uh, not necessarily, but it's a perk. <laughs> it's a perk. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We talked about the weather's better. It's a great city and let's keep it hush hush for now. Cause we may want to move at some point. So let's keep it quiet for a year or so that Asheville yeah. is a gem. And then once then let me move and then the prices go up. That's the I way. won't tell people what the price of houses are here yet. So Good. don't worry. We'll keep that Good. on the down low. Keep it there. How about family? Talk about uh, married kids, anything like that right now? I'm married. So um, my wife's name is Miranda. And uh, we have a Corgi who is our baby boy. And we have a Maine Coon cat who is our baby girl. Uh, no kids right now, but we do anticipate having some uh, sometime in the next couple of years is kind of the goal, but it doesn't happen. It's not a big deal either. Exactly what, uh, what we said. We were married five years, uh, went on a trip to California to go to a wedding in Napa and did the Pacific Coast Highway down to San Diego over like the next two weeks or whatever. A lot of time to talk and a lot of time to just be together. And it was like, what do we do next? We had traveled, we had done all this stuff. It's like, let's try. And then boom, pregnant. Like we thought, yeah, a lot of people, it takes some time. Some people can't, you know? So we thought, all right, it'll probably take us a few, <laughs> few months, but you know, I should have known, like, 
I mean, look at me, right? Like, you know, right away, if I want to have a kid, I'm going to make a kid, right? Like, that's just people see, see me. And that's what they think. Like, obviously he's going to nothing to do with my wife's ability to be, to, to make it's just <laughs> me, all me. So <laughs> dripping right. in testosterone. That's what I like to say. <laughs> um, all right. Well, talk about uh, life happiness. Do you have a life happiness, happiness index score? And what are you working on most in that? Uh, yeah, I, mine is an 8.3. Um, wow. I was at that uh, like last year or two. And um, I think that of all the areas that I was trying to improve from last year, one of the, one of the most important ones was exercise because I'm not sure if you've experienced this, but moving requires a lot of energy output. So, um, you move and you get in this new place, you're setting everything up and you're like, holy cow, I have to take care of myself. So, um, when we had moved, it was November, December. So the end of last year, I was kind of feeling a little bit like, oh, I need to take better care of myself. So that was why setting that new goal of 365 hours, um, and, uh, living up to it, which I've been on track for, I'm actually over my hours right now, uh, for the year. So, um, I've been feeling great and, that is that has me at an 8.3 for this year right now. So excellent, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, we already talked about contribution. Let's talk a little bit about your GoPod. How often do you meet and what's the discussion right now? We meet every week. Um, we have an incredible GoPod. Um, one of my objectives on my environment down at the bottom was to create the most uh, the most accountable GoPod in the world. And so every single week we set our objectives, we are pushing each other to do the things that we set every single week as far as accountability and really um, being a part of each other's lives, which I'm, I'm happy about. And um, the current discussion is underwriting triple net properties nice. um, because one of our GoPod members just put an offer in on one. So uh, he brought his underwriting to us and we underwrote it together. Um, but he's got that deal, I believe, locked, locked and loaded nice. right now. So we're happy for him. Um, yeah. And then next week, we're going to be looking into, uh, we have my accountant coming on board, I believe, to discuss um, tax saving strategies. I like that. So you're bringing in guest speakers, you're doing some different things, just like different uh, themes each week. And I like the accountability push as well. That's really cool. Yeah. How about trips? You have any other trips? I know you just got back from Park City. Any other events you're planning to go to? Uh, so right now we're planning a live event for April here in Asheville, where all of our students from our masterminds are coming. So that's like what I'm pretty fired up about as far as like a big adventure. Um, then this, uh, this year we have a number of like, I would say micro trips this year. We're doing a weekend in, uh, the Smoky mountains. We're still exploring Asheville. So in a sense, like move living here is a trip in a sense for us, me and my wife. So we're just having fun going out to eat, meeting cool people here in town. Um, doing anything and everything that we really want in this area, which I think is going to take us at least another two years to explore everything. Yeah. You were saying it's an amazing spot. Like I said, my wife went to the go wives trip down there and uh, loved it, but I've never been to that part of the state. I've been through Charlotte, you know, kind of the more populated areas, but never been through Asheville. So I'll have to make a trip at some point. All right, let's wrap this up with a question from the go abundance card game. And it is, and I think I, can, I know your answer to this, but if time and money were irrelevant, what would you do with your life? If time and money were irrelevant, what would I do with my life? Maybe I don't know that. Um, I'd probably keep focusing on ways to have fun. Like my number one value in life is deep, meaningful relationships. Mm. Um, so my, like on my vision board in my morning routine is wake up and kind of looking at this document that has like, who I want to be in the future. And I see myself working on important problems with people I care about. That's what I want to do. Would the, would the problems change? Perhaps. Right now, I love the problems that we're working on as a team and my team loves the problems. So I'm like, I'm in the perfect place. But I always told people like, I could be happy as a garbage man. Granted, I was with great people who were who enjoying picking up and solving garbage as a problem. I mm -hmm. like doing stuff with great people. That's it. I don't need to be riding around on yachts. I don't really enjoy longer vacations where the idea is to go drink margaritas on the beach. That's not my personality type. I want great people. I want awesome things to do that challenge us as a crew. Um, so 
that's kind of a higher level, not like a spe specific answer, but that was, that's what I would do. I think that's great, man. I love that. I, I think the uh, margarita on a beach idea is great for like four hours. I think people get this <laughs> idea that you're going to do that for, and then what you're going to be overweight, diabetic, you know, for like six <laughs> months doing this. Like it's, it's just not that fun for that long. It sounds like the dream, like, Oh, I'll just do that all the time. But yeah, you're going to do something. If you have any, any sense of achievement in you, you're going to do something with your life. And I love what you just described. So Paul, how do people reach out, learn more about you? Where do you want to direct them? What's the best place to, to get to know what you're doing? Go check out contentcreator.com. Um, we have a variety of awesome courses there. Um, if you're in GoBundance, check out the Courses Coaching and Masterminds Micro Tribe. I'm running that right now. And uh, we're having an absolute blast in there. We're actually building people's courses on those calls. So if you want to grow, come to those. We're having a blast in there. Um, my email is Paul x at contentcreator.com. And uh, yeah, reach out. Do you have any questions? I think, uh, I think I have Monday, as we record this Monday at 3 PM Eastern, I think I have a coach's course, course of coaching and master my micro tribe. I just joined that a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I will be on the next call of yours. So I'm looking forward to it, brother. Thanks for being on today, man. I, I really appreciate it. Great getting to know you. Love your story. Love all of what we talked about. So yeah, thanks for the time. Pleasure, brother. Appreciate you.